Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Armenian Music Project. I have Kristapor Najarian with me. Welcome. It's been a while. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen you, too. Uh, when was the I'm good. When was the last time we, uh, we, we, we saw each other? I, I'm thinking it might have been UCLA like 10 years ago or something. I think so, too. I think it's been a long time. Yeah. It, uh, it might have been at a Dilly John concert, actually. You're right. It probably was a Dilly John concert. So what have you been up to recently? Congratulations. You ha have a new diploma. What have you been up to in Paris? Uh, for, you know, tell us a little bit about that experience, and then we'll go mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. Well, I uh, just spent the last year in Paris, and uh, after, I, after I graduated UCLA, I did a lot, of, a lot of working as a composer. I took commissions and um, did a lot of writing. And then I thought, you know, I, I felt like I, I wanted a little, um, a little bit more training. I felt like maybe I, I wanted to expand my skill set a little bit. And so that's when I looked into, you know, graduate programs and, uh, and, I, and I found the Ecole Normale in Paris. And uh, I found out that uh, Eric Tanguy was teaching there. And, uh, and I, really, I really enjoy his music. I've heard his music since I was in high school. And um, so I applied there and, and, uh, and I met him and he's an he's a incredibly nice guy, incredibly talented composer. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, I, you know, like your music, come, come to my studio, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll work together. So I spent the last year over there in Paris at the Ecole Normale and I've uh, been studying with him. And um, yeah, so it's, it's good to have somebody who's a little bit kind of further along in the in the process of of being a um because he's he's you know one of the one of the most established composers today one of the most established french composers so it's good it's good to get his perspective on a lot of things um you know whether it be the musical aspect or professional aspect but uh yeah so it's kind of like it's kind of like a collaboration mm. more so but but uh, it's been really, really enjoyable this past year. I've learned a lot. And I just, I just got my Diplôme Supérieur from the school, which is kind of like their, their version of a master's degree. It's not okay. exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not exactly structured the same way as a master's is here in the U.S. But, uh, but for, their, for their purposes, it's kind of, kind of similar. Okay. So what are some differences between that diploma and the master's degree in the U.S. for those who are listening and have no idea what the differences are? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, a master's degree here, which I've never gotten a master's degree here, so I can't speak with certainty, but I know, you know, many, many people who have. Um, there's a kind of a required course set, and I think there's sort of, um, I think there's more of an expectation where, you know, if you do the coursework, you do do your homework, you know, you, and you, for composers, you, you know, we have to do sort of like a recital at the mm -hmm. end of our degree program. Um, there's kind of an expectation if you kind of meet all of those criteria that, that it's okay and you'll get your degree and it's very kind of like check the boxes, you know, and uh, at least in my experience in Paris, it's not quite like that. Um, it seems to be a little bit more subjective <laughs> in terms of, uh, who who they let through the the uh, the system because uh, for example uh, at the end of the year we have a jury which is similar to what what we have in the U S and um, and you present your scores to a, a jury and the people who sit on the jury are from another university they're they're different professors different mm -hmm. professionals and they're not related to the school so you have uh, people from all over the country coming to judge your work and they may have very different opinions than your own professor about what constitutes good work mm. you know so um i heard some horror stories last year of some people who you know did did everything right by their professor but then when it came to the jury aspect of it um the jury didn't agree with the artistic choices they had made as composers and uh because of that they they did not pass their jury wow and so it's uh, it's pretty crazy, um, you know. I think it, there's a lot more expectation on um, sort of like what what people see as uh, the not the right style, but kind of like what is the uh, um, 
what a modern composer should be. I think there's more expectations for that over there. Yeah. Whereas here, I feel like we're a little bit more open in terms of that. Uh, I feel like we value a lot more uh, several different styles. Whereas there, they kind of have a a general sense of of you know what a modern composer should be, and and uh, I don't think I don't think my teacher conforms to that at all. I don't think Eric Tangi conforms to that at all. I think he's very uh, open-minded, and in, in that all of his students have very different styles of composition mm. and um that's what i like about his studio is that we all kind of have our own unique voice and he he encourages us to find that voice mm. and um he never says you know sound like me he said i don't want you to sound like me i want you to sound like you yeah so uh so yeah i i enjoy that i think studying with him is kind of like a change it's it's uh it's different than a lot of people's experience Mm -hmm. over there in France, in, in Paris. Like I said, it's a little bit more subjective than, yeah. than it is here. Well, when we first met, I, I, uh, we met because you're a violinist. And I think the first time, at least, that I remember, we met because there was a conducting uh, masterclass workshop at UCLA. I came to conduct uh, as part of that masterclass. And you were a violinist. I think you were the concertmaster for a piece I conducted, maybe. Uh, so how did that happen? When, did you compose when you were younger? Or did the transition to composition start when you were in college? Like, oh, I really enjoy composition. I want to do more of that. When did that whole journey start? And how did that... Um, transition happened to you mostly composing now and we'll get to the playing as well yeah it's interesting because um, I kind of always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to be a composer ever since I was a kid um, and but most of my training musically up until I was at UCLA was almost entirely instrumental and um, as a violinist and, uh, you know, I play guitar too. I, I play a few other instruments, but violin's obviously my main instrument. Mm. And um, so, yeah, my training was almost entirely on violin. And then uh, once I got to UCLA, I was encouraged by people, especially uh, Professor Pogosian, Moses Pogosian, who, you know, we both know very well. Mm -hmm. um, he encouraged me to write things, start start getting the, the juices flowing, you know. And... Uh, and then I thought, yeah, yeah, I, I, I really like this. And so I, I ended up doing a, a double major for my last few years at UCLA um, in composition and, and violin. And then, uh, yeah, and things progressed from there. I just sort of uh, gradually evolved more into doing composing. And I still, I still play quite a lot, but, um, but uh, I, I'm doing composing a little bit more nowadays, I think. Yeah. And when we scheduled for this uh, chat to happen, I went on your website, I was reading about you, and I knew quite a few of the things that I read on the website. But one thing that surprised me was that picture of you with a guitar. So I, I oh, yeah. really didn't know that you play the guitars. Tell me a little bit about the guitar, and then we'll transition into your parents, because I have a feeling your dad had something to do with the guitar. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, I've been playing guitar pretty much as long as I've been playing violin. Um, but it's never been something that I have uh played very much um in public i've played i've played quite a bit like uh, uh i do more i do more jazz and blues and stuff like that with the guitar and um and i've kind of used it as like an instrument that is kind of like my thing for me and so i played a lot um it's a very like personal thing um whereas the violin is like you know i play it all the time concerts and stuff like that so um the guitar has always been kind of like a very personal thing private thing um but yeah as far as as far as my parents go um you know my my dad like like you were saying he's uh he's a luthier he builds instruments and he, he he's a master of the oud mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I'm, I'm i hope that most people would know what the oud is who are listening but it's uh, it's a traditional Middle Eastern instrument, uh, you know, eleven strings, and it it's really the ancestor of the guitar, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the ancestor of the lute, mm -hmm. um, which then you know became the guitar. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and he's a, he's a master builder of, of those instruments, and he's also a master player. He's a yeah. he's a fantastic performer. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe it was something about those sounds, like the sound of the oud that, that drew me to the guitar or something. I, I, don't, I don't really play very much oud. I play a little bit, but it's, uh, you know, I, uh, it's intimidating when you're living with someone who's such a good <laughs> player of that instrument. You don't wanna, you don't wanna tread on their territory. So I, I play a few things, but you know, but guitar is is uh, is my thing. And then, uh, and my mother is also a, a pianist too, a very very talented pianist, and she's done a lot of conducting and um, and music directing and things like that. So um, yeah, a lot of a lot of musical influence growing up from the two of them. Wow, uh, that's amazing. And and yeah. uh, one thing with Armenians, and I especially for this program, I like to hear about this because Armenians are you know all over the world in every city you could think of. You know, for example, I was born in Yerevan, Armenia. My wife my wife was born in Pasadena, California, and her family came from Lebanon. So uh, you know, Armenians all over the place. I've had people on this program who are from Canada and other places. Uh, and tell me a little bit about your journey. I think you were born in uh, the U.S., but tell me about your your you know, uh, yeah. ancestors, Armenian ancestors. My, my dad, my dad was born in Beirut. Uh -huh. um, um, and uh, his, his father, my grandfather was born in Beirut. And my great grandfather, um, you know, escaped the, the genocide in 1915. And he, he you know, uh, immigrated to Beirut, to Lebanon. And um, my grandmother's family uh, went to Syria, mm. you know, to Dezor, they did the, that whole Thing. And she, she was born in Aleppo and, um, and then they met uh, and uh, my grandmother moved to Beirut and then my family uh, immigrated here to the U.S. in 1975, I think. I'm getting the, the year right. And uh, yeah, and my father, um, he moved here when he was about 11 or 12, Wow, I think. And uh, yeah, so, you know, Arabic and Armenian were his first languages, but he, uh, I think he's forgotten almost all of his Arabic. I think he speaks uh, <laughs> a little bit, but it's mostly English and, and Armenian now. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of their, that's kind of their story. And gradually more of our family members came over from Beirut, you know, as the years went by. And now we have a few family members over there still, um, who unfortunately were affected by this recent you know tragedy that happened over there um but yeah that's um yeah it's like you said we have you know family all over the place i think with a lot of armenians you have yeah. family in multiple countries and and that was kind of their that's kind of like a little bit of our history of our yeah. of our families you know, and I was going to say, your dad moved here when he was 11 or 12. I moved here when I was 11. Uh, my family moved from um, post-Soviet Armenia at the time to uh, L.A., which um, uh, was, you know, in some ways a very life-changing thing. But at the same time, growing up in Glendale, it seemed like so much didn't change because I went to school with so many Armenians. And surprising to some, but my uh, first teacher in the U.S. was... Uh, an Armenian American, uh, so it was it was really it, it was really kind of a smooth transition in some ways. Even though the language I had to learn the language and get used to it because I had n not learned English at all. My my first two languages were Russian and Armenian, and uh, I I had no uh, idea um, of what I was getting into. But uh, slowly I learned, and I'm still working on it. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back to a little bit about, you know, you've done, you've had so many performances, both as a violinist and also as a composer. You've had your pieces performed all over the place with some renowned musicians as well. What are some memorable performances? I don't want to say it for you because I've read the names that have performed your pieces and you've mm -hmm. worked with them, but some memorable performances that were really, you know, important for you that yeah. you can think of now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the first, the first um, really important one was uh, right after I had graduated uh, UCLA, and uh, I was asked by Moses Porosian to write a piece for the Diligent series in LA. And uh, he said, do you want to write a, a violin duo for Ani and Ida Kavafian? I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, because they're, they're fantastic musicians, fantastic violinists, and, uh, and as I came to know them, they're fantastic people as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that was a, a really amazing experience getting to work with them and writing the piece for them. 
and uh, and and they performed it at the Dilly John concert. They premiered it there, but then they've really uh, enjoyed the piece and they've taken it with them all over the place. Uh, they they played it in Armenia. I got to go watch them play it there in Armenia at the at the Opera House, which was really really fun, um, fun experience. And um, they played it around the U.S. And uh, so that that's been a, a you know a great experience working with them. And also uh, Antonio Lisi, who is a professor of cello at UCLA, also a fantastic cellist. Um, he asked me to write a uh, piece for cello duo. Actually, after he heard the violin duo, he said, I, I really like this. Would you write something for two cellos? So uh, I wrote a piece for him and uh, one of his doctoral students at the time, uh, which is called Rhapsodic Fantasy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's for two cellos. And the whole, the whole idea behind it is that um, the cellos are supposed to be tuned differently, scordatura. Um, as we call it, so each cello uh, has a different tuning than 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 normal, and uh, so that would that was a great experience working with him and kind of like learning about the cello from the inside out, and uh, that that that's been a really memorable one and kind of keeping in in contact with with him over over time and everything, um, yeah, and uh, so now. Now, who knows when we're going to have another uh, performance because of the, what's going on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm sure that, I'm sure that uh, you know, before we know it, things will, things will come back to, to normal. I hope so. And we'll, we'll be able to have some more performances yeah. of things. Do you yeah. ever perform your own works? Have you, for example, that duo, have you ever performed that, uh, the, the duet that you wrote uh, with someone else uh, performing your own piece? Yeah, I've performed them many times. Um, I've performed it all over the place, actually. Yeah. Uh, I've played it with, with Moses Pogosian, too, which is great. Um, and uh, we played it one time in Colorado uh, for a genocide memorial concert at, um, at the Colorado College, mm. I think. Uh, and that was, that was a lot of fun, getting to play with him. And it's, yeah, it's a different experience performing one of your own works, I think, because... Uh, well, first of all, being a violinist, I, I played through everything on there. So I kind of, I knew it from that perspective. Um, it'd be different if I had written something for the flute, let's say, where I, you know, which is, it's your instrument, right? Yeah, that's right. How do you yeah. know that? Come on. I, I remember that. I that's remember a top that. secret. <laughs> oh, no, no, no secrets. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it's different if you write something for an instrument that's not your instrument. But, but when you know it like that, uh, there's a certain amount of comfort, I think, when you're performing it because you kind of, you obviously know what's coming next. Um, but at the same time, you want to do a really, really good job with it because it's your, your work. And, and uh, you know, if you're not going to play it well, then how are you going to yeah. expect other people to, to take it seriously, you know? So, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun playing, uh, playing my own music <laughs> so i hope to do i hope to do more of it in the future uh yeah but let let plenty of other people play it as well <laughs> yeah one thing that's yeah. really always impressive for me uh you know uh realizing the type of work that composers do is their understanding of all the instruments and what's possible how is it like especially for the first time maybe that you compose for an instrument that you don't play how, how what, what what's your approach how, how do you do it um just just that whole mindset and approach to composing for an instrument that you have you know no idea about yeah yeah um well it's a lot of research yeah. it's a lot of conversation it's a lot of uh, listening and uh studying scores and uh talking with people who are performers on that instrument um you know for example I, I actually just finished a piece for solo flute and uh actually before our conversation i was re i was rehearsing it with uh, the flutist uh this morning and uh but that whole process of writing it was was interesting because you know you have to you have to find all the great repertoire written for the instrument and just you know study that and you have to uh study all the scores and listen to all the music and and um and the most important thing also is after you finish the piece you have to work with the performer i think that's that's one of the most important things as a composer is you have to uh find performers who you trust who you feel like will give you honest feedback about about what you've written 
and that they'll be honest and tell you, you know, this works, this doesn't work, mm -hmm. or why don't we try this? Why don't we try this? Um, so it's really much more of a collaboration, I think, when you're when you're writing for an instrument that's not your own, at least in my experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, for most most composers, I think, who who value what the what the interpreter has to say, I think it's more of a collaboration. Uh, obviously, the the creative part, a lot of the musical inspiration comes from the composer, but then it's kind of channeled through the, the performer in a way. Yeah. 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 You know? Is there a routine? Yeah. Uh, is there a routine that you have? Do you compose every day, or do you just compose when you get a commission? Do you compose just because you want to compose for that ensemble or that instrument and instrumentation, and you just compose something even if it doesn't, even if you don't have a scheduled performance or uh, an ensemble? Yeah. What's your What's your routine? It's funny because um, I used to I used to feel that way that you know compose when there's inspiration and <laughs> and. Uh, but you know, being a, when you're being a professional, you can't do that. It's it's like work every day. You have to do it every day. It's just like practicing your instrument. You know, uh, keeping up your technique on your instrument. So you know, right now at this very moment, I just finished the commission for solo cello, and there's kind of an in between period now where I'm you know looking for another commission and stuff like that. But you still have to keep going. And and uh, right now I'm I'm working on a piano trio um you know to to um because i i also discussed that with uh, eric tongi and he said you know why don't you try this why don't you try doing something like this so so i'm working on that now but yeah um yeah i used i used to kind of be of that mindset like i would only compose when when i had a commission or there was something expected uh but then you kind of you kind of get stale you know in the meantime if you're not working in the meantime then you have to kind of you know, retrace your steps and find out where where you were before that. So um, I think I think uh, going forward, it's super important to make sure that you make uh, you know a daily effort of it. It's something you do every day. Yeah. So that's what I do now. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, inspirational figures, uh, musicians that have inspired you, uh, that have influenced your work, uh, maybe some uh, musicians that are not Armenians, but since this is an Armenian program, it'd be great to hear some inspirational artists uh, that are Armenian and have inspired your work. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the classics, you know, Gomidast and um, Sayat Nova. I love Sayat Nova. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, the great composers of the you know 20th century like Khachaturian and Tumanyan and uh and uh you know Edward Mirzoyan mm -hmm. and uh but also our modern giants like Tigran Mansurian mm -hmm. and uh Artur Avanesov I love his music too um and uh actually uh, Tigran Mansurian was there for the premiere of this violin duo that I was talking about with, with Ani and Ida. And, um, and he, and he was in the, actually he had a piece performed at that concert too. He, it was a piece for solo viola, if I'm remembering right. And, um, and he came up to me at the intermission and he said, Oh, I, I really, I really love that piece. He said, Johnny Gus shot, was it shot, shot, what it is. But, uh, and anyway, and so uh, he asked me if I wanted to get a coffee sometime. I said, yeah, of course. So we ended up going and getting a coffee uh, one night, one day. And, uh, and I, at that time I had a commission for a, a string quartet. So I was asking him about his advice for, you know, a string quartet, you know, what his advice was. And we sat there at the cafe. I think we was, it was in Glendale. It was, um, was that coffee bean in Glendale and on uh, is it Honolulu? <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyways, we just sat there and we listened to string quartets. Just in the cafe, he would say, you know, play this one, play this one, and then uh, and he was kind of just giving me his own little wisdom, and he told me about um, you know, because he knew Khachaturian, and he said, you know, Khachaturian said that uh, a premiere, like a world premiere or something, is supposed to be like a beautiful chandelier being turned on for the first time mm -hmm. it's supposed to be kind of glorious you know like wow and he said you know i don't really feel that way he said uh the premiere doesn't necessarily have to be um something magnificent you know mm -hmm. it can be something very subtle or it can be uh 
um, yeah, something understated, something like that. Anyways, but he he's been a really he's been a really big influence on me and his his music because he's uh, I think you know he's the greatest living Armenian composer. I think most people agree on that, and so he's been a, a you know a, a guiding guiding light for me in terms of you know um, aesthetics too. You know, like what does it mean to be an Armenian composer, which is entirely different topic you know not not super different but it's it's related and uh so uh yeah he, he's been a big inspiration yeah for sure well yeah. uh since you brought that up i want to ask you and i know that's a really big topic but what does it mean to you to be an armenian composer is it you know some people might say oh, it's incorporating you know folk music some people might say it's just you know, it is, it, it, you know, you don't have to incorporate folk music, just composing and being Armenian and that's enough. What, what does it mean to you? And I know there's a big, huge question, but may, maybe some of your thoughts, I'm, I'm sure you've thought about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is, it is a big question. Um, and on the surface of it, like what you said, just being Armenian and composing, yeah. you know, just by being an Armenian and composing, you are an Armenian composer. Yeah. Um, but also I think for, for us, because we have such a strong history of, you know, folk music and we have our classical music too, the church music. Um, I think it, it might be a shame if an Armenian composer didn't take advantage of that too, of the kind of the rich, you know, musical history that we do have mm-hmm. and kind of use that as an inspiration. Um, and that's, that's what I do a lot. I, I, I'm very inspired by Armenian folk music and, and from the broader Middle East too. Mm-hmm. Um, like you know, my father's from Lebanon, like I said, and so he he has. I've grown up listening to his, him playing oud, all different types of music, you know, Arabic and Armenian. Um, so that's kind of what inspires me. But uh, it's different for every every composer, every Armenian composer. Um, yeah, but also um, because I'm half Armenian, that's also an, an interesting thing too, because. Um, there's also a big question of like, you know, identity all the time. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, do you, do you ever, you know, is it, is it possible to be like a fully Armenian composer or, or, uh, you know, the fact that my father's Armenian, my mother is not Armenian. Like, how does that factor into it? Those are things that I think about, you know, as like, um, as, um, somebody like that but it also is someone who's raised almost entirely with my armenian family i guess i identify more with with that side of, of myself um you know like i went to armenian school and stuff like that and anyways you know i learned armenian so so anyways so so i guess yeah i think i think more on the along the lines of an armenian composer armenian american you know um but yeah, it's it's a very it's a very tricky question. Like, what yeah. does that mean? Yeah, I think it's just a very yeah, it's a very personal thing. Yeah, yeah. And Alan Hovannes, uh, you mentioned Armenian American. Alan Hovannes, his uh, mother was uh, Scottish ancestry, if I if I'm not mistaken. His father was Armenian, and he actually spent um, maybe the last couple of decades of his life here in the Pacific Northwest. So he has a big connection here as well. And uh, I'm sure maybe he's asked that question to himself many times and thought about it many times. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's it's just it's it's great to think about it and 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 just kind of uh, have, have you know see what other people feel about their you know personal feelings about these topics. Uh, even though even though many yeah. questions are unanswered, and we keep learning about our, ourselves as we as we grow, you know. So that that yeah. answer might be different next time we chat in ten years or something. Um, yeah. Something outside of music that you're passionate about that you do, uh, any hobbies, anything that you do outside of music? Um, I love uh, photography. Mm. I'm really into photography. Um, I took a few photography classes in high school and I, and I fell in love with it. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, have, I have a DSLR, you know, and I, I use it, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's nothing fancy. But um, I love just you know, looking at photography and uh, um, studying it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge National Geographic freak. And uh, so I, I have a huge amount of respect for, for those photographers who do what they do, because it's an insanely hard job, mm-hmm. what they do. And, and to see the images that they get from, 
you know, all, all corners of the world is, is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I haven't had a lot of time to go and shoot for a while, but, uh, but I'm, I just enjoy looking at it when I can't go out and shoot and just kind of, uh, yeah, appreciating all the, the images. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'd have to say my favorite is Steve McCurry, mm-hmm. who is, who's been a national geographic photographer for forever. But, uh, yeah, I, I follow him on, on Instagram. There's so many, so many good opportunities to, to see photographers work on Instagram too. Cause it's a really easy platform. You know, you can just go scroll and see all these amazing images. So, um, so that's, you know, that's a way that I kind of stay in touch with it right now, but <laughs> I used to, I used to be a lot more into it and now I'm, I'm kind of pressed on time, but yeah, but yeah, that I'm, I'm, I really enjoy that photography in some ways uh, you could also um you you people appreciate it especially artists because that's also you know composition you know photography is composition and it it takes you know as a composer some composers you know have a certain flow and they might not go back and erase too much but there are many composers that I've talked to over 100 episodes on my other podcast and also on this uh platform is that you know they they might go back and do it change things and edit things and add things and completely throw it away and restart again on a piece that they're working on so in some ways it is very much like photography because i don't even know how many millions uh, of shots they take before they pick that one it would be great to get into that mind of a photographer or even have a podcast or something with a photographer i'm sure there are where why did you pick that picture because there's yeah. another picture that looks similar to that but i don't see something because i'm not a photographer but because this photographer has so much training all those years of experience they saw something that you didn't see and that's the reason why they picked it, even though it's so small, you know? So it's, it's just, it's amazing to get into the minds of some of these, you know, artists and photographers and, and see why they, they made the choices that they made. Um, it's just fascinating right. to me. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This might be a tough question. Uh, I, I answer it the best that you can, but an Armenian artist that you would uh, love to collaborate with, you would love to have your piece performed by them, whether you, maybe someone that you've already worked with or maybe someone new that you would just love to have your piece or pieces performed by that artist or that Armenian ensemble, specifically Armenian, mm. since this is an Armenian yeah. show. Yeah, um, I'd love to work with uh, Sergei Khachaturian, the mm. violinist, because uh, he's a fantastic player. And uh, yeah, I think he'd play my duos really well. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to play them with him. But yeah, uh, no, he's 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 a fantastic player. I love his playing, and uh, so I, I I follow him. And um, yeah, he he'd be a great great one to work with. Yeah, I would love to work with him. And uh, yeah. Well, ho- hopefully sure. one day uh, I'll I'll see a duet of you two playing the duets together. That would be great. That would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Have you have you interviewed him? Uh, I haven't. I haven't interviewed him, and um, I, I should I should have him on, and I should have you on my other podcast too. So I, I basically have these two um, podcast type of things, uh, where you know both of them started around the same time, about three years ago. But this Armenian project, I kind of put it aside initially. It was just with composers, so I uh, interviewed some composers, and then I stopped and was busy with other projects and did my podcast, which has over 130 episodes now. Um, and, uh, but now I want to bring this back and specifically talk to Armenians and about the Armenian identity and some of the things that we talked about are uh, other Armenian artists and collaborations and all these things specific to Armenians, but I'll definitely have you on, on my other project as well to talk more sure. general broad things, but no, Sergey would be great. Yeah, and I, I should reach out to him and have him on, uh, one of these days. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> Any collaboration, and I had Rafi Besalian with me. I don't know if you know that name. He's an Armenian pianist. He lives in Atlanta now. Uh, and we yeah. talked a little bit about this topic. Is the Armenian, uh, Armenian Americans or Armenians in diaspora working in Armenia or collaborating with Armenian artists? Uh, he talked a little bit about how he's tried things and it hasn't worked out too well yet. Uh, and he hasn't mm. had a performance in Armenia since he left about 20 years ago. Uh, but and he's mm. performed all over the world, Japan and other places around around the world. Uh, but have you? Uh, I know you've had one performance at least. But have you? Uh, are you? Do you have a connection there? Are there more performances coming up in Armenia? A little bit about your experience specific to that connection. 
Yeah. Um, I would say I'm very lucky in that I have both had my works performed there and I have performed there. Um, Cause when I was in, in UCLA, we, we uh, took a, took a, we did a tour there with the Dilly John series and uh, I was playing in a string quartet at the time. And we actually did the Armenian premiere of uh, George Crumb's black angels, wow. um, which was a very interesting experience to play it there. Because uh, I think I think the public were a little bit less than receptive to it. <laughs> I don't know, but because I think I think in general the the Armenian public is very they're very well educated in terms of music, and they really they know their stuff. in in terms in comparison with the American public, which yeah. you know is like um, not as not as uh, not as well versed, I think, in in the arts or in music. But um, so I thought they might have been more receptive, but it is a very um, kind of a very, um, well, how should you say? It's very forward thinking for its time. So it's, so it's, I think it maybe caught them off guard a little bit, but I will say um, that I, I would, I want to have as strong of a connection as possible with, with uh, Armenia because uh, you know, it's, it's something we all have in common. It's something that every Armenian has in common. And uh, I think, you know, it can only be enriched if we all contribute and if we all find some way to contribute there, especially artistically. Um, you know, um, like I said, uh, I was lucky to have the Kavafian sisters perform my duos there, which was fantastic. Um, and I have another friend who is actually a Lithuanian violinist named Boris Lifshitz, and he travels to Armenia quite often. He's not Armenian, but he travels there quite often and gives concerts there. And he's performed uh, some of my pieces there as well. Um, so I, I have not been there in maybe five years, uh, but I would love to go back as soon as possible and uh, you know see, see everything that's changed. I'm sure it's changed a lot in five years, especially after the revolution and everything. Yeah. But yeah, and I also know that there's a there's a festival there called the Vera Tarts. I think uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, and uh, it's about bringing our diaspora and Armenians, you know, back uh, to to do concerts and uh, you know specifically with that in mind. Mm -hmm. And I haven't participated in it, um, but I I know that it exists, and um, so you know I, I think there are definitely there are definitely people who are looking to do that, to bring in more diaspora, diaspora and Armenians in terms of artistic involvement. Um, and I hope, I hope it continues. I hope it grows mm -hmm. because uh, we have so many talented Armenians that are, that are part of the diaspora, like you said, Rafi. And, and uh, I mean, just name it, we have so many. So, um, so I think it, it will only be good if we, if we can continue to, you know, strengthen those, those ties, mm -hmm. you know? That's yeah. a great point. A couple more questions before we end. I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, you, you mentioned your dad and you mentioned Oud. I have to ask, any chance you're going to compose for Oud and a string quartet or something or Oud yeah. solo, any, anything, any projects like that? Or have you even, do you, do yeah. you might even have some sketches that we don't know about? <laughs> yeah, actually, um, the, the funny thing is I, I've, always wanted to, I haven't sat down and really done anything, but I know that, you know, my, my mother is a fantastic pianist, like I said, and, and uh, so, and I'm working on a piano trio right now. So what I'd really like to do is do like a, an oud trio sometime in the future where, you know, that way, that way my father, my mother and I could all play oh, together. Wow. And that would be, that would be cool. So I kind of think of this piano trio as like a warm up, And okay. after that, and maybe do the the U trio. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would be that's going to be a fun project, I think, in the in the near future. Yeah. And for those who don't know, uh, another Armenian composer who I'm a big fan of, Avet Derderian, uh, he wrote quite a few symphonies, and he's been instrumental in in incorporating folk instruments in his symphonies. So um, uh, every every time I think of that type of a collaboration, I always think of Avet Derderian, and I'm sure there are many others. I think Vacha Sharafian who's another Armenian living composer in Armenia, composed for Duduk and a string orchestra, mm -hmm. I think, and other uh, instruments, for, for, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, one last question. Um, 
uh, advice to young musicians, and you're still considered a young musician, but based on your experiences and everything that you've done, uh, what would you say to other young musicians? Yeah, I would say uh, maybe don't take too long to take it to start taking it seriously. <laughs> the reason the reason I say that is because I think I am one of those people who uh, is what you might call a late bloomer or somebody who got serious. You know, later I've been I've been a musician since I was young, and I and I uh, have always loved music and everything, but um, I didn't necessarily approach it with the same seriousness that I do now. And um, in terms of making it a real effort, you know, daily to to uh, practice your craft, you know, whatever it is, composition or or violin or whatever. And uh, you know, that's something I I guess I wish I I would have done more of uh, when I was younger is is to um, you know to to take it a little more bit more seriously and and uh, because it can only help you you know even even if you decide it's not for you that being a musician isn't for you at least you've you've reached somewhere where you can you can be proud of of the work you've done and everything so you know working hard I think translates no matter no matter what you do so Anyway, yeah, that, that's, that's what I would say. <laughs> well said. Thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Anything else you want to add yeah. we missed that we didn't get to you want to uh, mention before we end? No, I just, you know, want to thank you for having me on. And yeah, it's been great catching up with you. Yeah. I, hope, I hope we can do it again. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. I really, when, when um, we chatted about having this thing, I, I, I was trying to think when, when the last time was that I saw you. And really the only time I could remember was the UCLA um, uh, conducting masterclass, which you were playing at. Uh, but uh, then yeah. you reminded me that it was the Billy John Chamber concert series, which is in LA, which you're right. I think that was the act actually the last time I saw you. Hopefully we'll see uh, each other again. Hopefully we'll collaborate again. And hopefully we'll, we'll do more of these uh, in the future. For sure. I hope it doesn't take 10 years like this last time. <laughs> yeah, have a beautiful day and see you soon. Take care. Thank you, man. You too.